Okay. I think we can get started. Okay, good morning, colleagues. Um, compliments of the new year from everyone at the African Alliance. Um, it's great to have you all here on our very first COVID-19 conversations of 2021. We have a really exciting month planned for you. Um, next week, we speak to the Deputy Director General of the Department of Health, Dr. Anban Pile. The following week, we speak with Professor Helen Rees and our colleagues from the leadership of SAPRA to better understand that regulatory environment. But today, we're really excited to have this first COVID-19 conversation with you. Colleagues, as a reminder, these calls are brought to you by the African Alliance and the Vaccine Advocacy Resource Group. They're brought to you in partnership with the COVID Community Constituency COVID-19 Front, the Treatment Action Campaign, and APA. Today we speak to Pina Kodisang, who is the CEO of the Seoul City Institute for Social Justice. In this role, she leads strategic direction and accountability for the programmatic, operational, and financial aspects of the organization. With a master's degree in social development and a passion for youth, Pina has participated and contributed to different national, regional, and international panels on finding solutions to different issues faced by the youth, such as HIV, GBV, and other structural issues that perpetuate social injustice, especially for young women. Pina is an outspoken gender activist and in her work at Salt City, she continues to raise awareness of issues facing women and young girls and for advocating that those in positions of power be held accountable for their role in addressing these issues. She's a proud single mom of two, a daughter and a son, and proudly wears the label feminist. Soul City, 26 years old, 1,350 soul body clubs across South Africa, over 2,000 rise clubs for young women. And Tian, can you still hear us? I can hear you, but it was frozen for a while, so I'm not sure. Okay, I think we've just lost Tian. I've sent him a message, um, trying to get him back on. Okay, sorry about this. Apologies, colleagues. I'm just trying to contact Tian. There seems to be a technical problem.
Hi, everyone. Um, Tian's back, but I'm just putting you on speaker. There seems to be a um, power outage in his area. Tian? Okay, great. Thank, thanks so much, Vivian. Can everyone hear me? Um, yes, we can. Okay, great. Yes. So, um, I'm not sure where I ended, um, but I was just introducing um, our colleague Tina Kodisong from Sorcity and speaking about some of the really impressive work that Sorcity has been has been doing across the country, from the Soul City, from the Soul Buddy Clubs across South Africa, the Rise Clubs for young women, the political and advocacy training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really, really exciting for us to have you here with us today, Tina. And we wanted to start this call by really just giving you a platform for about 20 minutes, just to give us a brief on since COVID arrived, what have the measures that both cities have to take? How have you reconfigured? How have you pivoted? How have you innovated to ensure that the critical issue of women and girls, specifically violence against women and girls and gender-based violence, remain on the agenda in a world where we live today that is overwhelmed by noise of all kinds on COVID-19. So thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate you making the time and over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we appreciate the opportunity that we are given as an organization, you know, to talk about the work that we do. And um, it's not lost to us that this opportunity is a good one, not only to profile the organization, but to also share what we feel are best practices and um, to learn, you know, from what others are doing as well in, uh, as we share how the different organizations are handling this pandemic that has made life very difficult for all of us. So I really thank you for, for this opportunity. So let me talk a bit about who Soul City is because we have had a, a number of iterations as an organization. There are people who still remember that Soul City where you know, at the time our logo was, a, people say it's a red cross, but it was a, a, red, a red band aid, you know, uh, because at that time we were doing behavior change communication and uh, doing um, communication around health promotion. So people still know that Soul City, the Soul City that was on TV with different drama programs and um, focusing on the re-engineering of health, focusing on educating the public about um, policies that were there, be it it was the uh, policy on children, you know, we, we, we've had many iterations, but where we are right now in 2021, we are clear that as an organization, we are an intersectional feminist social justice organization whose work is mainly focused on supporting women and girls in challenging patriarchy and its resultant injustices. We know that we live in a very patriarchal society, in a society that has put women aside, in a society that conveniently forgets that women's rights are also human rights. So as an organization, whatever that we do, we center the rights of young women and girls as human rights. And we also make sure that whoever is accountable for holding, for upholding, for protecting those rights knows that it is their duty. When they conveniently forget that it's their duty, we are there to remind them that it is their duty. And we really advocate that they take up um, their duties seriously and implement for young women. You rightfully indicated that we work with uh, rice clubs, we work with Soul Buddies. Soul Buddies is one of our old flagship programs. It's been there for more than 15 years and it's still going strong because we believe that children's rights are also important. Children have a voice, they have agency, and it's important that they are also included in decision making, you know, as active citizens, not just children being seen but children must also be heard. So meaningful participation of children is equally important to us, especially at this time of a pandemic where children are locked in homes with parents who are abusive sometimes. They are locked in homes with carers who are abusive. 
some of their rights, um, you know, the right to education. For some, they are infringed because access is now a problem. So our Soul Baris program is one that we continue implementing in partnership with the Department of Education and the Department of Health. But also we include parents. We cannot do anything and it should not be a design of any program to work with children in isolation. It should be that the parents are centered in whatever intervention that we are designing that includes children. In that way, you are strengthening both your primary and your tertiary, your primary, secondary and tertiary interventions. I think a lot of times programs just go straight to the target. We, we forget the ecological model where at the center you have this individual, but the individual doesn't exist in isolation. They come from a family. That family is within a society and that society ultimately uh, becomes the community that we live in. So if your interventions are only centering on one-on-one -on -one with your target audience, your soul body member, but you are not doing anything around the community to work with the families, you know, or other community members, you are then setting yourself up for failure because you will have this individual who's empowered, who has knowledge, but who cannot enjoy the benefits of that knowledge because the society that they live in is behind. They don't have the same kind of knowledge to create an enabling environment to enable this child to fully enjoy their rights and to fully participate. With our RISE, um, and, and so the Soul Buddies is your eight to 14 year old. With our RISE clubs, we work with young women between the ages of 15 to 24. And that age group, um, I think people that are on the platform know why that age group is important. One, in terms of vulnerability to HIV and AIDS, we know that that's the age group that, it, that is hit the most in terms of new infections. So you need to work with them uh, to make sure that you sensitize them to the risks, but also once they are sensitized, you also make sure that action is taken for them to access services to prevent new infections. So a lot of programs that we do with young women, you know, it's, it's more about giving them information, correct information to make better informed decisions about their lives. So we equip them to stand up for social justice as well. Um, and social justice in different um, intersections of their lives. Uh, one area that we work in is the sexual reproductive and health space, where we know that young women at that age, 14 to 24, start experimenting. They start, you know, um, developing, their bodies are developing, they are going through these changes that are sometimes difficult to navigate and understand. So you also need to make sure that when you work with um, the nurses, the teachers, they understand from the perspective of this young person who's developing, who's exploring her sexuality. You know, they must be enabled to explore in a safe space, in a space that has created an enabling space for them to say, maybe I want to date girls, you know, maybe that's the preference that I have and not being judged for that. And maybe I want, you know, um, to start having sex, but have that space explored in a way that when you want to experiment, you know what to do to protect yourself against um, STIs, new infections of HIV as we were talking, but also when you don't want to explore that the space is safe to say those who choose not to explore, you know, um, are not judged by those who, who are choosing to explore. So it's a space where you create a platform for young women to come together and talk about all these um, developments that are sometimes frustrating for them because they're not understanding their own bodies. They are not understanding, their parents are not understanding them. They feel that they don't understand themselves. They don't understand why their parents are not understanding. So you need to be in a space as a young person where you are allowed your agency to explore. So the young women's clubs are basically for that, but not only sexual reproductive health and rights, you know, where we encourage them to go to the clinic, 
to access HIV tests, to access uh, uh, treatment for STIs, and, and uh, abortion. And to prevent um, pregnancy. But we use that platform to teach leadership, to transfer leadership skills. And this is, in the pandemic, this is where we see the importance of doing that, of empowering young women to know what they Women don't rights. deserve rights. They don't deserve rights. To know what their rights are. You know, chapter two of the constitution talks about protection and advancement of people who have been disadvantaged. No, I'm from or Canada, unfeed. we don't have rights in Canada. So, you know, young people always feel that they are not seen, they are not heard, they are not recognized. And we need to create a space where they feel that they are seen, that they are heard, and they are recognized. So one area where we work with them on this is what we call the raising voices of young women. And I'll give you an example of how this project has actually created a formidable force, a movement of young advocates who know how to access their rights. And especially now in a pandemic where uh, we saw even in the first lockdown how you know the need of young people were set aside because we were now all of us taken back by this pandemic that just came on us. Some clinics were not providing the necessary services. Young women, were, we were all locked down, so we couldn't access services. But I think it was a disadvantage for young women who are on, or who are on contraceptives. Sometimes we, we think they're on contraceptives because we call them low T. They are chatterach, right? They, are, they can't wait to have sex. But a lot of them, if we are reflecting honestly, a lot of them, their experience of sex is coercion. They are being raped. And for some, the decision to go and prevent pregnancy is not because they just want to have um, sex all over the place, no. They understand that their future is important to them and therefore they are going to make sure that they are protecting themselves against unwanted pregnancies. We create platforms where they can report violation, sexual violation, where they can have within the safety of their home, resources such as Hello Rainbow, which is, 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 is an app you can access on um, Facebook Messenger, where you just go to Facebook Messenger and you say Hello Rainbow, and you are able to talk in the privacy of your space. You know, if you are being violated, you are able to report to someone. So with the Raising Voices, uh, on the 4th of December, a letter was submitted to COCTA. This is now young women using their voice to advocate for their own safety, for their own development. And allow me to read um, the letter that was submitted. It's a long letter, I'm not gonna read all of it. I just want to read the part where I feel young women were demonstrating that they want their rights to be protected. They want to be heard and they want action to be taken. And action, not only where we are concerned about how many people are going to access um, vaccine, how many people are testing, but not forgetting that even in this pandemic, the rights of young women are still important. They still have a right to be protected. So allow me to read um, a paragraph from that letter which was submitted to Minister Dlamini um, Zuma uh, on the 4th of December by young women. I quote what they are saying. They are saying, we are not seen, we are not heard, we are not recognized. Our agency is not recognized in any development process. Street lighting is a critical development intervention that many municipalities can deliver with ease. This small intervention will go a long way in contributing to our safety in communities. They go on to note how because of corruption, which is at the center, these resources are not being availed. The IDP, which is a process where local municipalities budget for things like street lighting. They note with concern that these processes are affected by corruption, therefore denying young women the right to access safety. Safety that is provided by just having a street light so that when they move in their communities, they move in an area that is visible, not um, darkness. So they are also saying uh, in the second paragraph, they are asking for opportunities to be created 
for them to contribute to strengthening service delivery, oversight, and other processes at local municipality level, including how COVID-19 is addressed at local municipality. Where is the platform where young women are called to say, what are your needs? Even in this pandemic, where are we failing you? Where are we not meeting your needs as young women? So they were writing to say to the minister, we want action to be taken. We want something done where as young people, again, we are seen, we are heard, and we are recognized for the agency we have and the skills we can contribute to solving some of these problems. So one of the things that I think is critical and Soul City takes very seriously is the issue of accountability. I think we, we don't hold each other accountable enough. Government sometimes blames lack of resources. Civil society sometimes blames lack of action from government in terms of sometimes we feel despondent. We feel, you know, we've, we've done it all, but nothing is happening. So I'm like, I, I would like to challenge all of us to say, can we really go back to the drawing board and look at how are we holding each other to account? When COVID-19 happened, the rights to education were affected. Some of the young women have not gone back to school. Some of them are now a statistics in terms of rape. They are now a, st a statistic in terms of pregnancy, you know, and we seem to ignore some of our own issues in terms of statutory rape. I think that for me is one of the big things where we, we are comfortable just to note that 10 to 15 year olds have given birth in the past 12 months. But do we know that it's a violation? It's statutory rape. Who takes action? Who is held accountable when such happens? We know that um, even the sexual violence uh, rates went up uh, that Minister Pekitelo was reporting on last year. We know there's inaccuracy in uh, those reports. But we can't ignore, even if it's one person, even if it's one individual, we can't ignore the fact that violation of young women, sexual violation, violation of young women in South Africa is a pandemic. It's a pandemic within the bigger pandemic of COVID-19. And our efforts have not yet yielded results. So as Soul City, we call on everybody to start looking at what is your response? What are you doing as an individual, as an organization, as government? What are we doing? On our media pages, we post a lot about actions that people can take to take care of themselves in this pandemic. We encourage normalizing, asking for help if you feel overwhelmed. But I think collectively, there is still something that we are not pushing in solidarity together. For, um, for solutions towards achieving this um, eradication of um, gender-based violence. So we need to stand together. It's not lost to us, you know, that there are efforts and we must give credit, but I don't think we must celebrate. We are not yet where we can say we are celebrating. I, for one, am not yet celebrating because I'm a woman. I can be a statistic anytime. You know, so what are we doing? Can the pandemic not be an excuse for us not to take action? So there's a lot that we are doing um, to contribute our voice to this. We've just recently had a TV talk show um, on SABC2, an eight part uh, talk show, which was mainly around, you know, looking at patriarchy as a system that must be dismantled until we dismantle patriarchy, until we call it out for what it is, and until people who are enjoying the benefits of having this system, people who are benefiting from having this system that is unjust to the majority of people in this country, the women of this country in their diversities, you know, until we dismantle it, we will keep talking about the same things over and over and over and over and over. So I want us to look at what can be done to dismantle. It's a huge system, so we know 
it can't just it won't just collapse in one day but there must be a starting point and there must be somewhere where we say done and dusted this one it's now complete let's move to the next one we are not yet there what is stopping us you know right now each time the president addresses the country he will talk about let's note that gender based violence is a pandemic let's do our part to contribute to solutions but i sit every time and wonder why is it that other things we are able to solve why is it that with the crime report that was given there were crimes that the minister and his team were able to report as um, going down but sexual violence gender based violence femicide keeps going up where is this thing coming from have we interrogated why it's hard to do that, to, to, you know, to dismantle um, this gender-based violence and femicide and the benefits to whoever it's benefiting of this thing. So I wonder um, where this year, 2021, with um, the pandemic as rough as it is right now, people are dying, you know, um, people are scared, but over and above that women, are scared. So if, if, if a man is scared only of dying because of COVID-19, women is scared of being raped, be, uh, contracting COVID-19, trying to get treatment, but on her way maybe to even go to the clinic, being violated, might even lose her life. So women are scared of so many other things that are layered, while men are only scared of contracting it and probably dying from it. So we need to do something. We are failing women. And uh, the work that we do really as Soul City with the young women, with the different partners, is to say, what next? We can't sit until we see solutions. Programs that are there, they are there to just look at the temporal solution. You know, I know how during lockdown level one, we were supporting Rise Up Against Gender-Based Violence, uh, Mandisa's, um, Mandisa Kanyile's organization. We were supporting them in terms of some of the food parcels, because again, at the center of these pandemics, women, young women, children suffer. You know, we were supporting their effort, but even in doing that, we were saying, this is a temporal measure. It's for now, it's to make sure that they are not hungry now but how are they going to get out of that cycle? Economic development is slow across the country, but women are the most affected, you know? Um, education, I mentioned earlier. Again, rights that are being violated, just a mere right to be protected by the state is something that we are not achieving. So the work that we do calls for all of us to take arms, uh, and I'll use the word arms because we are in a battle, we are in a fight. Um, I'm not inciting violence, I'm not asking you to go and shoot or kill people, but I'm saying we are in a violent period of our lives as women. So we need to make sure that the state understands the dangers that we are in and the solutions that they've brought to the table have not yielded results. So are we, are we going back to the drawing table? Are we going back to engaging? How are we engaging differently from how we've been engaging? So this year we are looking at, um, it's something that is in the pilot phase. Um, we've done our feasibility study and hopefully we will be able to start rolling out. But we are looking at a feminist academy because we believe we need a feminist solution to the problems that we face. And note, I'm not ignoring the fact that COVID-19 is something we are dealing with. Even a response to COVID-19 needs to be a feminist response. It needs to center women. It needs to center adolescent girls. It needs to center children. And excuse me, I'm not saying men are not important. I think each time you start focusing where attention is needed the most, People come and say, but what about men? I'm not going to talk about men, not because they are not important. I'm going to talk about where the problem is and where the issue is. Men can have discussions with other men somewhere about 
what they feel is not happening or should be happening. But my focus as an organization, as um, Soul City, is women, it's young women, it's children. We know that they are the most vulnerable, the most affected. So we need a feminist response. We need a response that is responsive to the needs and the rights of women. Even now as um, vaccines are now being lined up, we need to make sure that how they are distributed is equitable, you know? Um, so we need to make sure that those people who are in spaces where they engage with government on distribution or rolling out of vaccines really speak on behalf of women and children. We know that we already live in an a, a, an equal society, so we don't want equality. Uh, in, in, we don't want equality. We want an equitable response. Women have been left behind for the longest of times, so we need to bring them closer to where we now start to close the gap. Their mobility is reduced, and therefore there are spaces where they have support is affected. Yeah. So we need to find virtual solutions for women. Psychosocial support cannot be underestimated. It is needed, and women need those resources availed to them. Maybe let me pause here and see if there are questions or if we can engage. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Pina. I think, you know, wow, just listening to you speak was actually quite, it's quite an emotional roller coaster. I think because in part, the very special place that Soul City historically has in many of our hearts and in our minds, quite a few of us, depending on our age, um, had different stages of our childhood um, impacted by Soul Buddy, certainly. And so just listening to you speak today really is really just reminds us, number one, of the importance of legacy organizations like Soul City, who have really just stayed the course and have been a staple of the South African civil society landscape, speaking truth to power and advancing um, and amplifying really, is really, really important issue. Um, when you spoke about accountability, you know, that particularly um, occurred to me last week, Friday, we submitted a complaint, um, you know, against the actions of the Chief Justice around vaccines. And it just really brought home and reminded me the essential and critical role that we all play in holding those who hold power and privilege and platform to account. So thank you so much for that um, that look back and look forward. Pina, you know, you spoke a lot about, or you touched on the issues of the unity of civil society, of our collective strengths, of whilst recognizing that the engagement of men and boys are important. Um, your particular politics and strategy at Soul City are really around focusing on women and young girls. And that made me think about, gosh, more than a decade ago when we first had the discussion around an NSP for GBV. And of course, a lot of us on this call actively work on and support the GBV, the HIV NSP. And in the early days, the NSP on HIV, TB, and STIs was really regarded as one of the key ways in which you could bring together a range of stakeholders to develop this strategic pathway, but not only a pathway, but an implementation plan, and perhaps more importantly, a budget. And so we've come in leaps and bounds, as I'm sure you are very um, familiar with, with the development of our of this GBV, um, or what has been touted the GBV or NSP and femicide. What 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 is what has your experience been in the development and realization of this plan? What do you think the plan do you think the plan presents to us an opportunity? You kept on referring to us having to do things differently. We can't have business as usual. We need to really look at what we've been doing for years and years. Because certainly those of us who have been in this space for a while don't really see movement. You know, we've been saying this thing over and over again. We've been speaking about violence. We've been speaking about patriarchy. Um, and we just really aren't seeing movement. So with the advent of this national plan um, around GPV and femicide, what are your thoughts? 
on what this plan presents, if you feel it presents anything. Um, and do you believe that this plan represents an opportunity for us to make the progress that is very clear from what you said you are so hungry for? Thanks, thanks for that. Yes, we, we know that the National uh, Strategic Plan for Gender-Based Violence and Femicide is there. And um, as an organization, we also participated. And I believe in the six pillars of the NSP. I strongly believe that you know, they represent what our intentions are in getting to the bottom of this pandemic. But can we admit that to implement that plan to its fullest resources are needed? And where resources are needed, it's where we start seeing the division because there's going to be a call uh, for a grant to implement aspects of that NSP. As civil society, we are going to be the people who are competing to access those resources. You know, the, the, there's already issues, I think, in our interactions with government as civil society on even the, the engagements around that NSP. There are politics, there are issues, and that's where we get stuck. So we would have beautiful documents much like our constitution, beautiful, you know, articulate in terms of what it aims to achieve. But implementation becomes a challenge because resources are at the center of any implementation of a strategy, of a policy, of, you know, uh, even the political will to get that NSP implemented the way it's articulated. So I'm not saying it's a hopeful situation. All I'm saying is that Divisions always come when we now need to implement because then who do you give resources? You know, all of us are intervening according to our different strengths. There are those who do psychosocial support. There are those who do, you know, uh, support groups. There are those who are, you know, uh, making sure that the police are doing their job. There are policy makers. The law, the, we don't even have the law to support the implementation of the uh, NSP. I think it's a missing gap. It's something that is missing because if nothing happens, you can't take no one to, to court and say they, they've uh, contravened what has been passed as law in terms of implementing the NSP. So honestly, we, we work two steps forward and I believe 10, back, 10 steps back because we are not moving in tandem. We're not moving um, in solidarity. And I'm not saying we are not united. I know I, I sit in some spaces, you know, where every day we are talking about what next, how are we going to do this? What can we do? But our efforts are watered down by the lack of commitment in terms of the law. Also the lack of resources to make sure that each and every part, which is important, you know, it's a pieces of a puzzle. Each piece of a puzzle builds this full picture. So some at the time where resources are now critical, they don't have resources. You have those that are over-resourced, you have those that are under-resourced, those that are not even resourced. So how do you then implement an NSP to its fullest? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Pina, you know, you spoke about the unity of civil society. And I just want to ask, you know, it's, it's an issue that we face, I would say, almost daily in our work, as I'm sure you do. And that is the, the issues of power, the issues of ego, the issues of mm -hmm. agendas, the issues of resourcing and funding, and how we package and present ourselves as different formations of civil society, in part to be palatable to donors, in part to do the work that we're passionate about. Would you characterize South African civil society today as unified? I think we are unified in understanding that we are facing the same issues. You know, we know what monster we are facing and we know how to defeat that monster. Where we can start showing solidarity is how we then collectively challenge donors. I think we need to get to a point where we go to donors and start changing the agenda of the donors. There's a lot of imperialism that comes with the funding. 
you know, it's very imperialistic in its approach. It's money that comes from overseas and it comes with a certain agenda. And we fall into the trap of, you know, adapting, as you say, to make ourselves palatable to that agenda. But I think if we push back and say, in South Africa, money will come in for this, 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 and that, instead of being told we have money for this, Sometimes some of the money, a lot of money, a lot of investment goes to where the need is no longer dire. You know, where there's a dire need, we have lack of resources. So solidarity would be, um, would strengthen the pushback if we say there's no funder who's going to come and tell us we need to give the funders the mandate of what the funding should be directed to us because we are the ones on the ground. We are the ones who know what the needs on the ground are. But a lot of time we find ourselves having to adjust our programs, you know? So even when we know that as an organization, we want a feminist agenda, we want to push a feminist respond. If funders don't want to hear the word feminist anywhere, we remove the identity, you know? We adapt the intervention so that they don't sound too feminist because then we know we won't get the grant. But we need to get to a point where through our own resources that we co-create with local government, with our, I mean, our South African government, we now start giving a mandate to where resources must be directed. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite a formidable task. Um, but I think collectively as a civil society, we've, we've overcome much larger challenges and the work will mm. continue. You know, we've got a question in the chat, um, Pina from Lombasa, who's really touching on, I think, such an important issue, and that is, how do we make sure that young, that young girls and women access HR services, especially in the context of COVID-19? You know, we do a lot of work around um, inner condom access, and we've had all of these traditional distribution points that have just been shut down and having to deal with that coupled with this wave of stigma around healthcare facilities because increasingly we're, we're, we're hearing feedback that healthcare facilities are actually more and more becoming places that are, that are associated with COVID-19 infection. So in the past where we could rely on local clinics to refer communities to or to do work with, that's rapidly failing away. So what, what, do you, what do you think we need to do to make sure that access to SRHR services is protected and maintained and supported during this period? Because it's clear the situation is not going to change anytime soon in terms yeah. of being able to move around. Yeah, so I didn't get the first part of what was, what, how can we make? How do we make sure that women and young girls access SRHR services in the oh. context of COVID-19? Yeah. This is where the Department of Education really must be called out uh, because I know, and you know, um, there's a policy right now that, that was passed, I think a year or two ago, and with SOPs around how, because young people spend a lot of their time, even with COVID-19, young people still access schools they still go to school, whether they go on rotation or you know, um, with some, they go every day. Young, young people are in schools um, most of their time and we could use those spaces to still provide these services. And I know education will tell you schools are for teaching, yes, but young people are not just um, individuals who receive education, but the other needs are not existing even um, in parallel to their need for education. So have we really explored how we can use the school environment without disrupting learning and teaching to still provide these services, to avoid long queues in the clinics that are already under-resourced, overwhelmed, and now with um, this pandemic um, creating even strict restrictions on how many people a day can access clinics. So. Education needs to come back to the debate table around how the schools and the, the fact that young people spend six, seven hours of their time in that space can be used effectively to provide the 
sexual reproductive health and rights uh, services that are needed by young people. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. You know, Marsha Zali is touching on an important point in the chat. She's really speaking about vaccines, you know, and how, what are the, what, what, what work are we doing to ensure that women and young girls yet again are not left off the priority list, are not pushed back. You know, we say this in a context of, we know we have priority populations that will be targeting the first wave of vaccines for healthcare workers, those with comorbidities and those over 60 and 65. But amidst all of this so-called prioritization of who needs to access the vaccine, are you doing any work or has there been any talk within the sector around what work we can do and what innovation we can start thinking about now to ensure that, that women and young girls are able to access the, this vaccine in the first instance? I don't think I've, I have not personally um, participated in any forums yet, um, but I want to believe that now that um, the president has said there's a plan in terms of rollout, we will start engaging because of course, we want to make sure that once the rollout is clearly laid out, young women are not left behind. So I will ask colleagues like uh, Steve Litzke, who I think might have more information to engage us on um, what is being done uh, through SANAC to see if SANAC is playing any role there we would want to make sure that we advocate for young people, young women not to be left behind. And for safety, even in, I, I know one thing that is, is out there that I know, and um, we try not to find ourselves trapped in that, is all these conspiracy theories around vaccines. We need to clear that out of the way because it becomes a disturbance in terms of engaging meaningfully with young women about you know, the importance of um, accessing those vaccines. So conversations that will happen will need to, one, talk about, address these um, issues that are on the side, the noise that is being made, you know, and for facts to be presented um, to young people about what the vaccine will do and um, how they can access it. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, Pina, we're approaching the top of the hour, and so I just wanted to ask you to spend some time speaking about what do you view as the biggest threat to women and young girls in the next year in the context of your work? And what do you view as the single biggest opportunity for yourself, the soul city, and civil society in general to galvanize around the issues of women and young girls in the next 12 months? So the biggest threat and the biggest opportunity, if you could touch, if you could touch on that for us. The biggest threat will always be patriarchy because patriarchy is an enabler of violation of human rights. So while we know what our rights are and we can even list them one by one, we have a system that denies us access to those rights. So the biggest threat for us as young women is patriarchy. And the only thing that we can do to solve, to to get young women to enjoy their rights is to dismantle this system, as I indicated earlier, one step at a time, you know, because it's a big elephant, it will need to be taken down chunk by chunk with everybody, civil society, government, individuals, um, noting what role they need to play to make sure that we dismantle this system that enables a teacher to rape a student and still get away with it because when you engage a principal of a school, they tell you, this is the best math teacher we have. This school cannot afford to lose this teacher. Can we solve it amicably amongst ourselves? Where parents would accept somebody bringing, you know, 500 or 1,000 just to say, we apologize that our son violated your child. Forgetting that this girl lives with the pain and the scars forever. If we don't dismantle all these systems, that enable perpetration of violence um, that are entrenched in patriarchy, we are not going anywhere. Could you touch on the single biggest opportunity in the next 12 months where we can make movement and progress? Hmm. 
I think there's opportunities for me continuing to educate and teach young women about what their rights are is important because they, they now realize that they are, their agency to take action is important as part of getting to where they want their futures. You know, they need to take action. But um, I think the opportunity comes in creating an environment that dismantles the power of patriarchy. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. So most of our empowerment programs concentrate on giving young women resources. They know where to go, they know what to do, but we are not dealing with what disempowers them. So we are empowering them, but we are not addressing those things that disempower them. So I have the knowledge, I know where to go when I'm raped, I know uh, what to do when I'm raped, but that knowledge does not prevent somebody from raping me. So I still get raped with the knowledge of what I can do once I'm raped, you know, or what I can do to try and prevent um, myself from being in spaces that can bring me harm. All that knowledge, all that empowerment is useless if the system that continues to support perpetration is not being dealt with. So we, we have an opportunity to look at bringing that balance to say, on the one hand, let's continue empowering young women. Let's continue creating an enabling environment for them to thrive, to live their lives to the fullest. But let's not forget the huge responsibility that we collectively have to make sure that we are going to address toxic masculinity. We are going to make sure that the curriculum in school makes sure that young men understand that you need consent for you to have sex with a young woman. It doesn't matter what she was wearing. It doesn't matter whether you thought her smiling back at you meant she's, she wants to have sex with you. We need to make sure that we address those issues. So opportunity here is to look at innovative ways since all the methods that we've been doing have not yielded um, good results. You know, there are some results, but not excellent results. What are the opportunities we have with changing how we are teaching boys? What are the opportunities we have with really bringing stricter um, punishment for violation? What are the opportunities that are there? There are so many that we can take up. So let's look at where can we start? Where is the best starting place? And start doing something uh, that matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, colleagues, it's 10 53. Um, Pina Polisang, we would like to wrap up this call by saying that collectively we stand in solidarity with you and the work of the Soul City Institute. Um, we support the ongoing and amplified destruction of patriarchy. We wish you success and continued impact of your life clubs, of your soul bodies clubs, of holding those in power to account. We look forward to hearing about the Feminist Academy. Colleagues, Pina Kodisang is the CEO of the Soul City Institute for Social Justice. Pina, thank you so much for joining us this week. We look forward to continued engagement. Colleagues, next week, we speak to the Deputy Director General of the Department of Health, Anban Pilo. For recordings and transcripts of all of these calls, including questions and answers that we did not get to during the call, you may go to africanalliance.org.za. Pina Kodisang, again, thank you on behalf of all of us here for spending your Thursday morning with us, and we wish you all the best in your ongoing work and your leadership on the issue. Thank you. Thank you.